Yo, man. What's good, YouTube, man? It's your boy, man, Kel Naps, a.k.a. Mr. Napper, but man, today, man, we got the cocaine grandmother who was worse than Pablo Escobar. If you guys are new, man, hit that like button. Subscribe and share, man. Run away to a thousand subs. You know the vibe, man. Let's get it, man. Let's go. Say the godfather, right? Well, get ready to hear about the godmother of cocaine. She is Griselda Blanco. If she owed you money and didn't want to pay you, she'd kill you. Imagine a woman who ruled over the male-dominated ruthless empire of drugs and violence. She was the largest cocaine importer of the, at the time. A woman who ordered the execution of hundreds of people, including her own husbands and lovers. A woman who amassed a fortune of billions of dollars and lived a lavish lifestyle of luxury and excess. A woman who was so feared and respected that even the most notorious lords, like Escobar, bowed down to her. She was dubbed the godmother of pain, the queen of narco-trafficking, and the Black Widow. But who was this woman, and how did she rise from a poor and abused child in Colombia? to a billionaire drug lord in Miami. How did she manage to evade the law for so long? And what led to her downfall? What was her brutal life like behind the scenes as she juggled multiple lovers, enemies, and family members? In this video today, we will reveal the shocking truth about Griselda Blanco Restrepo's rise and fall from her humble beginnings as a poor and abused child in Colombia to her reign as the most ruthless and feared female drug lord of all time. We will uncover the shocking secrets of her crimes, her lovers, her enemies, and her fate. Are you ready to enter the dark and twisted world of the godmother of c**k? Then buckle up, because this is going to be a wild ride. Griselda Blanco Restrepo was a Colombian drug lord who was one Yo, of the- you know it's crazy? I watched the Griselda um, Netflix series about her and at the end I think like the last episode she was able to only get 12 years and she was out but the thing that was so sad bro the battle when she was in jail is all three of her kids died I think back in Colombia but I she was literally about to get out bro like I don't know I don't know I don't know if in the series if that was 100% like true but I, I think I do know like three like three of her sons died, but I know one of her sons is still alive now, but I know three of them died. She's literally about to get out, go be with her sons, but a bunch of dead lost her life, man. And that sucks. She's about to get out, go, we know where her her, her, her sons, but they they all Pioneers you know of the Medellin Cartel, the infamous organization that dominated the global coke trade in the 1980s and 1990s, and that gave rise to the legendary Pablo Escobar. Like most wow. Americans know of Pablo Escobar. Right. Well, she was there before Pablo Escobar on a much, a much larger scale. Pablo Escobar was uh, uh, stealing cars when she was already trafficking 3,400 pounds of cocaine in the 70s. She was also a mastermind of the innovation. Then I feel like you were able to get away with that back then in the seventies and eighties. I feel like at that time, that's when like the crack cocaine era became big. You know, in a sense, it was easy to. I feel like it was more able to sell. I feel like nowadays you try to do that, I feel like you'll probably get caught for that. I, actually, I don't know, maybe not, but I feel like. Probably different now. Innovation that created new methods of smuggling and distribution of coke, as well as the assassinations that changed the game of the drug war forever. She basically invented bringing coke from South America and into the United States. Born on February 15th, 1943, in Cartagena, a coastal city in Colombia, Griselda was abandoned by her father when she was still a toddler. She was then raised by her mother. Ana Lucia Restrepo, who was an alcoholic, and sold her body for money. Griselda and her mother moved to Medellin, the center of the narcotics industry in Colombia, when she was only three years old. There, she was exposed to a criminal lifestyle at an early age. She lived in a neighborhood that was so uniquely criminal that it had been designated a tolerance zone, which is to say a red light district, by the city. Things that were illegal elsewhere were legal in that little neighborhood. Griselda became a pickpocket and a thief before she turned 13. She was said what? to have committed her first murder when she was just 11 years old. She kidnapped a child. 11 years old was her first? Damn. So she was really already like that. So she was already on the from a wealthy neighborhood 
and demanded a ransom. When the ransom was not paid, she unalived the child by putting a bullet through his head. She ran away from home at the age of 14 to escape the abuse of her mother and her mother's boyfriend. She resorted to selling her body for money to survive in the streets of Medellin. She also became involved with the members of the infamous Medellin Cartel, a powerful drug trafficking organization that controlled the trade in Colombia. It was during this time that she met Carlos Trujillo, who was also part of the drug cartel, and trafficker who smuggled hundreds of Colombians into the United States every year. Trujillo and Griselda started dating when she was just 14, and it was under his guardianship that Griselda learned the ropes of passport forgery, drug, and human trafficking. Together, the couple started their own narcotics and trafficking business in Medellin. I believe he was her one true love. He taught her a lot. He certainly taught her how to smuggle. Their relationship continued for about four years, Man, and they got married. Already at that young age, knew about him. Damn. They got married when she turned 18 in the 1950s. Damn. So she was already like, damn. She, she was already in, okay? when she turned 18 in the 1950s. By 1962, the couple had three boys, Dixon, Uber, and Osvaldo. Griselda and her partner shuffled between Medellin and New York to run their illegal business. But when, in 1970, Trujillo died mysteriously of liver failure, Griselda took center stage. 27. Griselda should be a grieving widow, but Trujillo has served his purpose, and she has already lined up his replacement. Officially, Trujillo was said to have died of liver failure, but unofficially, Griselda was believed to have been responsible for his death. Even though this speculation was not proven, her innocence was questioned by her instant move to marry another gangster, Alberto Bravo. He forges relationships with men early on that are beneficial to her economically and then socially. Bravo was not in the business of smuggling people at the time she met Griselda. He was just an average drug dealer, smuggling a few pounds of illegal substances into the United States. But Griselda had a much bigger plan and ambition to build a narco empire in the US. This duo would then make a deadly criminal team that sparked an unprecedented crime wave that took the US by storm in the- I also really heard that like, she did mostly all this for her kids I think her kids can have a better life, but then like, right? I'm pretty sure she, I don't know if this series was true, but I heard in the series like, um, like she did it like, she did mostly all the stuff that she was doing and getting the money and all that. She was doing all this for her kids, you know what I'm saying? She said her kids like a number one priority. I think she did all, all this for her kids, man. 1970s. Bravo and Blanco are this perfect partnership. And they're in the right place at the right time with the right product. Griselda saw the potential to grow their small drug business to a multi-billion dollar empire. So in 1973, the couple moved their headquarters from Medellin, Colombia to New York. They already had the structure of distributors and local dealers in place, but their only challenge at the time was how to smuggle the addictive substance in large quantities. However, Griselda never ran out of ideas as she came up with the ingenious method of smuggling coke into the US, the use of lingerie with secret compartments. Blanco was very creative and had lingerie made with hidden pockets that could hold up to two to four pounds of coke each. They were creating garments. These garments were like she was a smart, she was, she was a smart, she was a businesswoman, man. At the end of the day. She was a businesswoman. At the end of the day, she came with good ideas. She was smart. That's smart. Smuggle drugs and 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 the bras. That's smart though. If you think about it, that's actually smart. Cause cause they're not gonna check her bra. They're not gonna check her bras. Come on, they're not gonna check that. That's smart. That's that's smart. That is smart. For she, she did that. to be more smooth around the body. It would just look like a woman's natural figure. She carefully handpicked gorgeous Colombian women as her mules. She trained them to dress seductively, flaunt their femininity, and flirt with immigration and customs agents to distract them from paying any close attention to them. She encouraged the women to dress very attractively, to be um, flirtatious with customs agents and immigration agents. Her mules would then wear these specially made lingerie with hidden compartments containing coke and fly from Colombia to New York without arousing suspicion. Immediately, they touched down in New York. Blanco's distributors and dealers were already waiting to receive them, and in a few hours, the addictive substance hits the streets. This method was revolutionary because it allowed them to transport large quantities of narcotics without using conventional methods, such as suitcases, cars, or boats. It also reduced the risk of detection by the authorities, who were not used to searching women's underwear for drugs. 
drugs. He's gonna suspect you. that a young woman who's see? very nice. Don't use her that time. See, they smart. She, she was a smart. She was a businesswoman. She was smart, bro. She was smart. I'll give it to her, bro. She was smart. Nicely dressed. Is going to be wearing a bra padded with. Blanco and Bravo's lingerie smuggling operation was so successful that they made millions of dollars and challenged the mafia's control of the drug market in New York. This godmother made her name as drug kingpin right here in this country. In Miami, in the 70s, in the 80s, she is so notorious, in fact, a documentary chronicled her exploits. However, their success also attracted the attention of law enforcement authorities, who launched Operation Banshee to bust them. In 1975, Blanco and 30 of her associates were indicted on federal drug conspiracy charges by the DEA. Blanco managed to escape to Colombia before she could be arrested, but she left behind her husband and her two sons in New York. Then later that year, Blanco confronted Bravo in Colombia over a suspicion that he was stealing money from their business. A shootout between the couple ensued, resulting in Bravo's death. Damn. She was the largest co importer of the, at the time. After the death of her second husband, Alberto Bravo, in 1975, Griselda became the sole leader of her narco empire. She moved to Miami in the late 1970s, where she established herself as the Coke godmother and the queen. So she was in New York first? I didn't even know that. Because in the end of Griselda series, they had a shoulder when, 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 when she like moved to like Miami and went right there. I didn't know like you know, she started in New York first because they didn't they didn't they didn't show that said so was it rushed i didn't know she was in new york so we should have at least got two seasons like i feel like that first should have been like where how she was young growing up like that and then like the new york stuff like that boom and then the second season should have been like when the miami of narco so, trafficking she, she was, was ruthless and fearless in dealing with her enemies and rivals she ordered numerous murders many of which were committed by gunmen on motorcycles a practice she was said to have invented blanco also enjoyed a lavish lifestyle in miami she had a mansion on miami beach diamonds purchased from argentina's first lady eva perone and a fortune in the billions. She also had a love for the Godfather movie, which inspired her to name her youngest son, Michael Corleone Blanco. Michael is the product of Blanco's relationship with her third husband, Dario Sepulveda, whom she met in Colombia after escaping from the US authorities in 1975. Sepulveda was also a drug trafficker and hitman who worked for Blanco. They married in 1981 and moved to Miami with their son. However, their marriage was not a happy one. Sepulveda was abusive and unfaithful to Blanco. He also disagreed with her over who would have custody of their son. In 1983, yeah, he see, left I, her I and returned to part. But in this series, um, I think he took their son. I, I don't know if that's actually happened in real life. I don't know if that was just like, I don't know if that was fake in this series. I don't know if that was true. Colombia with Michael Corleone. He, he demanded him. money from Blanco to give him back, but she refused to pay. Instead, she paid to have Sepulveda assassinated by hitmen dressed as policemen. They shot him dead Damn. in front of their son, who was then returned to Blanco in the U.S. One of Blanco's main rivals in the narco-trafficking business was the infamous Pablo Escobar, who what? was her former colleague in the Medellin cartel. In the late 1970s, Blanco noticed that Escobar was closing in on her territories both in Medellin and the United States. The godmother would not sit and watch this happen. However, a bitter feud ensued between her and Escobar. This feud later escalated into a bloody war that claimed many lives on both sides. Already by about 1975, she and Pablo were fighting, literally trying to kill mm. one another. Damn, so she was fighting with Pablo Escobar? Hey, no that. I didn't know that because because I was watching the series that Netflix didn't even show about she was fighting with Pablo. I didn't know that. So there's a lot of stuff that in the series they they didn't they took out or they didn't like they didn't even like they kind of at least gave us two three seasons. They gave us six episodes like rushed. I didn't know that she was beefing. I don't know that she had problems with Pablo. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Each had his or her team of assassins after the other. One of the most infamous incidents in their war was the Dadeland Mall shooting in 1979, which marked the beginning of the cocaine cowboy wars in Miami. On July 11th, 1979, two of Blanco's hitmen entered a liquor store at the Dadeland Mall where they gunned down two men who worked for a rival gang. 
The hitmen then sprayed bullets across the mall parking lot, hitting several cars and bystanders. They escaped in a van that was later found to be loaded with weapons and bulletproof vests. The van had a sign that read, Happy Time, Complete Party Supply. It's the worst violence in any U.S. city since the bloody era of Al Capone. It was another level of killing that cannot be explained by anything I think in her background. I think it's something in her soul. She was a born criminal. The Dadeland Mall shooting shocked the public and the authorities, who realized that the drug violence in Miami had reached a new level of brutality and recklessness. The officers who arrived at the scene dubbed the perpetrators in cowboys, a term that would later be used to describe drug traffickers and their associates who engaged in shootouts, kidnappings, bombings, and assassinations during the 1980s. Blanco continued her reign of terror until she was arrested in 1985 in California. She was extradited to Florida, where she faced charges for three murders, including that of a two-year-old boy who was unalived in a drive-by shooting. And she was tied to three murders, and authorities in Florida and in New York said that I'm pretty sure she only got 12 years. She got 12 years too. At I, least I they could have documented sure. 40 murders, and, and uh, that's still conservative because she uh, might have been behind as many as 200 executions in Miami, in New York, and in Irvine, California. She was convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison, but she was released in 2004 after most of the witnesses against her were killed or discredited. She then returned to Colombia, where she lived under a false name until she was assassinated by a motorcycle gunman in 2012. Ironically, she mm. died by the same Sicario assassination method she had invented. Again, so she was killed by a motorcycle assassin going into a butcher shop. It was a 69-year-old mother of four seen here in one of her many, many mugshots. As of yesterday, she is dead, gunned down by a motorcycle riding assassin as she stepped out of a butcher shop in Medellin, Colombia. Her death marked the end of a turbulent and notorious criminal mm. career that left a lasting impact on the history of organized crime and drug trafficking. Thank you so much for watching. Anyways, man, um, y'all let me know what y'all think down below. Comment what y'all think. Let me know down below. It's been your boy McCannaps. I'm out.